All righty, we carry on. Looking at the Gospel of Mark. Now, when we ended last week, we just looked at the account in chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, of the, the healing of the demoniac named Legion in the country of the Gerasenes, which refers to Gentile territory somewhere on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And the demons possessing Legion, they begged Jesus to send them into a nearby herd of pigs rather than to expel them from the region. And he grants their request. And when he does, you know, the herd rushes into the sea and drowns. Now Mark, he doesn't say what happened to the demons when their pig hosts drowned. He doesn't tell us that, but perhaps one is to think that they are thereafter confined to Tartarus, as other spirit beings are in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. But at the very least, those demons were left in a, in a state they'd hoped to avoid by asking to be sent into the pigs. Jesus allows the demons to go into the pigs not to benefit the demons. I don't think he's, he's working to help out the demons here, but I think it's to demonstrate objectively the magnitude of his exorcising power. That he casts from this person so many demons that 2,000 pigs charge off the cliff. And he knows, so he knows that doing that would glorify him and it would leave the, the demons with neither pig hosts nor permission to remain in the territory. So it looks to me like the Lord outwitted them, they say, rather than send us away, send us into this hurry. All right, go ahead. Into the nearby pigs they go, they go off the cliff, he's glorified, and they're left no better off, if not worse off. So that's what I think is going on. Now the local folks, you recall, they're afraid and they beg Jesus to leave the region. The healed man wants to stay with him and Jesus say, no, you go and tell what the Lord has done for you. And he proclaimed in the Gentile area that's called the Decapolis, which was a confederation of ten cities. He, he proclaims there what Jesus had done and the people were amazed. And then in chapter 5, verse 21, the scene shifts now back from this country, the Gerasenes, shifts back to the other side of the sea. And then in chapter 5, verses 22 through verse 43, Mark reports the healing of Jairus' daughter and the healing of the, the woman with bleeding. Now in, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18, Matthew ties the occurrence of those two events, the healing of Jairus' daughter and the healing of the woman with bleeding. He ties that to the time of Jesus teaching about fasting. He does it expressly while he was teaching these things or saying these things. So he does that while Mark reports his teaching about fasting back in chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. But notice that Mark chapter 5 Verse 22, it says simply that one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up. And that's why I switched out here. I used the Christian Standard Bible, just modified a capital letter there. I used that instead of the ESV, which takes this conjunction, which is simply and. And it's just a very loose conjunction of I'm reporting next. It's not a chronological tie like you get in Matthew 9, 18. Bottom line is Mark and Luke report this out of sequence, out of chronology. We know that because Matthew ties it specifically to the teaching about fasting, which Mark reports in two. But you know that about the Gospels, particularly about Mark. Things will be reported for other reasons out of chronological order, and that's what happened. But he doesn't specify that it's tied to it. So that's, I think, worth pointing out. In 523, Jairus, this synagogue ruler or this synagogue leader, he falls before Jesus and he tells him that his young daughter, we learn in verse 42 that she's 12 years old, he tells him that his young daughter is, is dying. Now in Matthew chapter 9 verse 18, Jairus tells Jesus his daughter now has died. Okay, so skeptics, of course, have long claimed that this is a contradiction in the Bible, but they're being unduly skeptical. 
That's certainly not a necessary conclusion. In fact, I suspect what happened is that Jairus' little girl was at death's door. When he left in desperation in search of Jesus, and when he finds the Lord, he tells him his daughter is dying or now has died in the time it has taken me to find you. Because he knew she was right there. So he says, my little girl is dying or now has died, but whatever her current state, whether she is still at death's door or whether she has crossed over and has died, whatever, whatever their state is now, if you will touch her, she will live. In other words, your touch will keep her from dying if she's still in that state of is dying, or if she's already died, your touch will bring her back to life. So that's what I suspect is happening there. And it turns out that his daughter had in fact died. As is reported to Jairus when they're going back to his, uh, returning to his house, when they're on the way. So when Matthew condenses the story, Matthew condenses the story, he leaves out the part of is dying. And simply has Jairus say, my little girl now has died. That then allows him to omit the part where the people come up and report. So he's condensing it. It's a fact. She now has died. At the time, he says, is dying or now has died. She has in fact died, as we know, as he's on his way to, to his house. And they report that she's now died. So when Matthew condenses, he just says, now has died. And then omits the part of the people coming up. Okay, now when Mark and Luke, Mark and Luke omit the part, they just say is dying. They, they omit the part about now has died. And I suspect they do that because it makes the subsequent announcement of her death more dramatic and is therefore better storytelling. In other words, you say she is dying. Well, he was aware that she could have been dead, but you just have is dying. And then when you have the report, it now has greater punch in terms of story. And it may be that their sources did it that way. That may be how Peter told the story. Okay, so when Mark heard it, so their sources may have had it. All right, that's all a footnote because when you hear these things, people say, oh no, you see the Bible's all contradictory. And I'm, I'm, I hope helping you when I deal with some specifics like that of seeing how to look at some of these challenges that people make about the Bible. And by the way, at least one major English version, the Christian Standard Bible, at least one major English version, it translates the relevant phrase in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18 as, is near death, rather than now has died. Now, if that's okay, and by the way, they don't, they don't just get, you know, uh, people off the street to work on these translations. So if that's okay, uh, and the Christian Standard Bible says it is, well then there's not even a surface conflict in the accounts. There's not even a surface conflict. Now as Jesus is heading to Jairus' house, it says in verse 24, right here, a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. As he's heading to Jairus' house, you've got these crowds that are just mobbing him. You see, I mean, you just picture these, these little roadways and streets and people just all over him it's like you know a mosh pit or something a rock concert I mean people are just cramming up against him and he's moving through these crowds and a woman was present who for 12 years had suffered from a bleeding disorder it was probably menstrual in nature she went to all the doctors she could find she spent all that she had in pursuit of a medical cure and she'd only gotten worse and her bleeding it threatened not only her health not only her health but it also rendered her ritually unclean and so it rendered her ritually unclean which limited her participation in Israel's religious life so it's a health hazard for her it alienates her from the people of Israel and participation in religious life and having heard the reports of Jesus' healings. So she heard these things and she obviously believed them. She was convinced 
that Jesus could heal her. And having heard those reports, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. And it says, because she was thinking, she was saying to herself as she worked her way through this dense crowd to be able to touch him, she was thinking to herself, if she just touched his clothes, she would be healed. That's what she's thinking as she's working her way through her. In other words, she was motivated to struggle through the mob because of her conviction that a mere touch of Jesus' clothes would be sufficient to remedy her hopeless situation. Now you have to understand the suffering she has gone through for 12 years. But she thinks and is convinced if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Now, she may have been trying to be healed secretly because she was embarrassed by her condition. Or she may have thought, look, uh, I'll get rebuked because these people will be going, you know, who are you ritually unclean daring to touch Jesus? They may have tried to prevent her from doing it. So that might be what's motivating her trying to do it secretly. What we know is that she was healed immediately upon touching Jesus' garment, and she knew it. I don't know how she knew it, but she touched whatever she felt, whatever came through to her, she was immediately healed and knew she was healed. Right at that point, she was healed and she knew it. Now, Jesus, with countless people in the crowd contacting him, all, right, he, he, all kinds of people are touching him. He perceived that in her case, healing power had gone out from him. All of these people touching, touching, grabbing, holding, pushing. But he knew in her case that there was something different about that touch. That healing power had gone out from him. And he turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Now the disciples, like everybody else, they're oblivious to what happened. They don't understand that Jesus is asking specifically about the one who touched him so as to be healed. I mean, if he's just asking about who's touching him generally, well then the answer is everybody. And they don't know that this healing power has gone out. Only the Lord and the woman know. And he turns around and says, who touched my clothes? And they're thinking, what? <laughs> who touched you? Everybody touched you. And of course, that's true, speaking generally. Now, I'm not convinced that Jesus did not know who touched his clothes. I'm not convinced of that, you see. Mark 5.32 says, literally, as I put it there, that he looked around to see the woman having done this. Now, it could be that the woman, that that's Mark's narration. Okay, it could be Mark saying that Jesus looked around to see the woman who had done it. Or it could be that he's, he's imputing that knowledge to Jesus. That Jesus looked around to see the woman he knew had touched him. So if that's the case, what's he doing? He's not looking to see who it was. He's looking for a visual. He wants to get a visual on this woman he knows who has touched him. He wouldn't let her receive the healing mercy of God and then slip off without giving God the glory. See, that's what I think is going on here. And the woman comes forward with fear and trembling. You say, why is she doing that? Well, she comes forward with fear and trembling because she knew what had happened to her. She knew what had happened to her. In other words, she's awestruck by the divine power and authority resident in Jesus. She knew how difficult this was. She had spent everything, had gone everywhere, believed he could do it, comes up and touches him. And what do you know? He did it. So it's like, who is this? You know, mankind apparently doesn't have the expertise or knowledge to be able to solve this problem. But here he did it. And he did it instantly. And he did it just for me touching his clothes. So she's like in awe about the power and the divine authority that's resident 
in Jesus. So she falls before him and tells him the whole truth, which includes witness to the great miracle done by the Lord. And Jesus addresses her tenderly. And he speaks to her and addresses her as daughter. And he tells her that her faith, meaning her trust in his authority and power to heal, that her faith in his her trust in that authority and power to heal, that it had healed her, in that God had responded graciously to her faith with healing. Her faith had healed her. God had, had responded to that. Now it's worth noting, at least I think it is, that in debates about baptism and salvation, you know, people always say, no, 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 salvation, baptism cannot have anything to do with salvation because if it does, that then nullifies the truth that salvation is by grace through faith because in that case it would no longer be by faith it would be by faith plus the work of being immersed okay so in this case I say well what's happening the woman is working her way through the crowd specifically because she is under the conviction if I just touch his clothes I will be healed so we are told that she has that faith and yet she is not healed until she, in faith, reaches out and touches his clothes. And does Jesus then turn around and say, your faith plus your work of touching me healed you? No. Your faith has healed you. You see, it didn't nullify that, did it? So the fact she called out in faith to receive the blessing did not nullify the truth that that blessing was received by faith. Well, I try to tell people that's how baptism is. You see, it doesn't nullify the truth that salvation is. Salvation is by grace, through faith, in or at the time of baptism. Okay, so that's a little footnote. I always like that text for that. Now, Jesus tells her to go in peace. Go in peace. He's telling her to depart as one who by God's mercy is free from all the distress and alienation that has plagued her for 12 years. All of the anxiety of what is wrong with me, what is going to come of me, and all of the alienation of being outside of Israel's religious life, he tells her to go in peace, depart as one who by God's mercy is free from all of that. And he also tells her to be healed of her affliction which, as Donahue and Harrington say in their commentary, is a word of assurance ratifying what has already taken place and guaranteeing that her healing is permanent. You see, it's like, go be healed. Live in the state of your healing. You see, go and be healed. And it's just a powerful thing. Now, at that time, some people arrived from Jairus' house with the news that his daughter had, in fact, died. Now, if I'm reading these things right, and if I think what's happened is he comes up and says, my daughter is dying or now has died. But either way, if you touch her, she'll be all right. Now he's traveling back, and here come the people, and they say, your daughter's dead. Your daughter's dead. You see, so though he knew or believed intellectually that Jesus had the power to heal his little girl even if she were dead. That's now moved from hypothetical to actual. You see, he's no longer just thinking abstractly. Yes, I, I'm convinced that if she's dead, he could heal her. He now gets confirmation she is in fact dead. That's a whole different level now. And that's why Jesus turns to, turns to him. He says, don't be afraid, only believe. Because he understood what would happen when you finally hear, it is in fact my daughter's dead. Well, now am I going to buckle and say, hmm. He just says, you don't stop trusting. You don't stop trusting that I in fact am able to heal her, to bring her from the dead. 
So he tells him that. Jesus has the power in his earthly ministry even to resuscitate the dead. Even to bring the dead back to life. To illustrate the power he will exercise for all of his people when he comes again and raises them to resurrection life. You see, that's what Jesus is doing here in his earthly ministry. I've said this before, why doesn't he heal everybody? Because that's not the time. Now he's simply demonstrating the nature of the kingdom. And so he heals some people. He raises some. As an indication that the day is coming when he will raise all people. All of his people are going to be raised to resurrection life. And so he comes in to this dead girl. Jesus with only Peter, James, and John. They arrive at Jairus' house where the people are weeping and wailing over the dead girl. You know, this is a 12-year-old girl. Parents, just think of it. You think of those parents in Florida who got a call and said, your child is dead. You think how gut-wrenching that is. I know some of you probably have lost children. I can think of no greater pain. I can think of nothing worse. And here's this 12-year-old girl, dead. And Jesus, they're all weeping and wailing, and Jesus comes and he tells them, she's only sleeping. You see, he is expressing in that his intention to raise her from the dead. It's just like she's sleeping, because I'm going to raise her from the dead. And so they all laugh at him. And Jesus then takes the parents and his disciples into the dead girl's room, takes the dead girl by the hand, and says, little girl, I say to you, arise. And she gets up immediately. She gets up immediately and began walking, which, as you can imagine, blew everybody's mind. Blew everybody's mind. And you can imagine these parents from this tremendous sorrow. And then here comes this teacher. Little girl, I say to you, arise. Man, this is something here. This is something. Mark says they were overcome with amazement, and I'm sure they were. And Jesus told them not to tell what happened. Again, he's probably managing his life and ministry in light of Jewish expectations about the Messiah. So he tells them not to, not to tell what happened and to give the girls something to eat. See, which demonstrates the completeness of her recovery. She's not here still, you know, well, she's up now, but she's stagnant. No, no, she's completely up, walking, go ahead and give her something to eat. And it also demonstrates his compassion for her because she's obviously been sick for a long time. Give her something to eat. Because I've made her perfectly well. Let her eat and enjoy. She's back. She's back. So this kind of stuff... As I say, people wonder, well, how did this Christianity explode out of this Roman backwater so that within a few centuries the emperor of Rome was a Christian? (laughs) Look, you have this person who's going around saying these things, doing these things in a historical context where something like this has been awaited. Well, that's how it happened. Now, Jesus next, in in chapter 6, verses 1 to 6, the first part, he goes with his disciples to his hometown, which is a small Galilean, the small Galilean village of Nazareth. And he teaches in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and the people are amazed. They're just floored. They can't understand where he got the wisdom with which he spoke. Or how in the world he's able to do such mighty works. But the fact, he's a local boy. You see, he's a local boy. One they knew as the carpenter. And whose family, you know, well known in the village. Well, that caused them to take offense at him. They took offense at him in the sense they rejected his message and authority. As Mark Strauss says, 
they are offended and perhaps jealous that this young upstart is acting with greater authority than his family background and social status warrant. And that's why Jesus said to them, he says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own household. You see, it's difficult for those who know you well, those who know a person well, to accept that the person can be so much more special than they are. I mean, you know, this is, look, I know you. I know where you come from. I know your family. Are you, are you kidding me? My kid's as good as you. You see, so that there's this idea and there's this tendency... This is similar in meaning to our English proverb, familiarity breeds contempt. You see, that's what, he's, that's what he's saying to them. Because of their lack of faith, Jesus' miracles, this is interesting, his miracles were limited only to healing a few sick people. Now that's quite interesting, only. I mean, when you're the Lord, and you're only you know, doing a few miracles, you know, it was limited only healing a few sick people. So that tells you something about the Lord's power. In other words, he chose in Nazareth. Jesus chose in Nazareth to perform miracles in response to faith as he'd done with the woman who was afflicted with bleeding and he'd done with Jairus' daughter. So he chose in, in Nazareth to perform miracles in response to faith. And because there was so little faith in that village, there were few miracles. He's doing miracles as he had done with the woman he had done with Jairus' daughter to people who have faith. And what do they do? How are they treating him here? They're all rejecting him. They're taking offense at him. And so for that reason, few miracles were done. And Jesus was amazed at their refusal to believe. He marveled because of their unbelief. Their unbelief was mind-blowing. What does that mean? That means that you would expect anybody in the circumstance to recognize that Jesus is somebody. They weren't having it. They weren't going to give an inch. And so he just marveled at how in light of the things he said and the things he did that they continued to refuse to believe who he is. And that obstinance, by the way, foreshadows the coming cross. This is mankind. This is mankind. That it's not about, well, you know, if I just had enough evidence and information because I'm evidence-based, I'm scientific. That's why. Look, don't tell me that. Don't tell me that. That's not what it's about. You see? You, I understand the idea. I understand how all of this stuff comes up and you protect yourself with that. I'm hip. Okay? But that's not what it's about. It's about you recognize that if you say Jesus is Lord, everything changes. So you're sitting here with your bricks and you're building, baby. You're building. How can I live with myself? How can I live with myself and convince myself that I'm okay in not exploring? Or so this is what's going on here. That's why he marvels at their unbelief. You see? That's what's happening. He simply marvels at their unbelief. And so, you see, I mean, this is what goes on and, and uh, you know, what they're doing. So Jesus now, <clears throat> their lack of faith... He doesn't do anything there. He then travels in 6, 6, 6 to 13, in 6b to 13. He travels about the villages teaching, and then he sends out the 12 in pairs, giving them authority over demons, over unclean spirits. And their work, it included preaching and healing. You see in verses 12 and 13, but Mark summarizes their work by focusing on the exorcising power. 
And why does he do that? He probably does that because that paints most starkly the spiritual war that's raging with Jesus' inauguration of the kingdom of God. You know, you're talking about a war. Well, here's Jesus ushering in this long-awaited kingdom and stuff. Why are there so many demon possessions? Why is everything? You, you, you just see that the heavenlies are roiled. Well, this is what's going on. And this shows most starkly this war that's going on, this exorcising power that Jesus has given to them. And Jesus charged the disciples as he sends them out to carry nothing with them on the journey except their normal staff. That's it. Just, just take your, the staff that you normally have in your daily living. They were not to carry bread. They were not to carry a traveler's bag of items. They were not to take money in their belts. They were to go only with the clothes they wore, not carried. Only with the clothes that they wore, their sandals and one tunic. See, instead of packing in anticipation of a possible lack, they were at this time to trust that God would meet their needs through the hospitality of people. So you are not to pack for the journey. You are not to take things with you that you're hoping will be able to offset a lack of hospitality. That's what he tells them. Now Matthew 10, 9 and 10, and Luke 9, 3 and 4, they express the same point but they do so in a way that has led to the charge that the accounts are contradictory. So if you've played in the world, this will be familiar to you. But they need not be read that way. And I'm just, this is again, let me give, give you a footnote, because I'm trying to stay on Mark. Okay, Mark has a certain presentation, but there are certain things that I think are so glaring, I want to alert you to them. I just can't go past them. <laughs> So consider this a little footnote over here about Matthew and about Luke. Now, as Matthew conveys Jesus' meaning, I, I've told you the meaning, what I think Jesus is telling them. You are to rely on the hospitality of people. That means you are not to pack. Just take the stuff that you normally have, what you're wearing and your normal staff. Okay, now, as Matthew conveys the meaning, Jesus instructed the disciples not to acquire things for the journey. Okay, same idea. You're not to acquire things for the journey. Not to gather items in preparation for traveling. But rather, you're to, they are to go as they were. This means that they're not to carry money, a traveler's bag, or an extra tunic. You see, two tunics are forbidden. Not to carry an extra tunic. So they're, they're to take a pair of sandals, not to carry... They're not to carry money, a bag, extra tunic, a pair of sandals. And by the way, Luke 10.4 prohibits carrying sandals in distinction from wearing them. Okay, so that's what, that's what he's going on. That's what's going on. They're, or uh, they're to go with only the clothes they wore. Sandals and a tunic and the staff they already possessed, not one that was acquired for the journey. You see, and that's what I, as, as the extra tunic and the sandals they could be bartered for food or shelter in a pinch and I suspect that's true of the staff in other words if I have extra things with me I can use them in a pinch to offset a lack of hospitality and he doesn't want them to do that he wants them just to go as they are and to trust that they will be provided for. Now Luke conveys the meaning by saying Jesus told them to take nothing for the journey, meaning no travel specific item. Could you read it differently? Yes, you can, but you don't have to. Okay, and that's one of the things about people. They, they say, well, no, I say, well, no, that's if you're hostile to the Bible. But if you are a friend of the Bible, then look at it this way. Okay, so this is what you have in Luke. Jesus tells them to take nothing for the journey, meaning no travel-specific item designed to protect against not being provided for through hospitality. He specifies no staff, meaning no extra staff. No extra staff. 
he specifies that no bag, no bread, no money. And he says they're not to have two tunics, only the one they wear. Okay, so I'm just saying this because I alert you to the claim. I want you to know that there are ways of looking at these things that put them together and avoid conflict. And someone would say, well, I don't think you're reading that reasonably. And I'll say, well, I am. I, you know, because I'm convinced that this is all written by the Spirit of God and they don't contradict. And so there are avenues here to put these things together. Now, I want to point out that in Luke 22, 35 to 38, this is later, Jesus draws a contrast between how things were previously, how things were previously when he sent them out in Luke 9 and 10, and how things will be in times to come. You see, he sends them out then and says, listen, you take nothing, you go as you are because you're to rely on the hospitality of people. But there's coming a time. There's coming a time, you see, when the world's hostility is focused on him in fulfillment of Scripture, whereas before the disciples could count on a warm welcome from a sufficient number of people that there would be no need for them to take anything for themselves. But a time is coming when there's going to be widespread hostility and persecution. And at that time, the situation's different. Okay, but here he's telling them, you just go ahead. All right, end of the footnote. All right, Jesus commands them to remain in the home that first receives them. Now, that's probably a safeguard. It's probably a safeguard against the temptation to accept progressively better accommodations from wealthier people. You can see how that would work, right? I come in, I stay with you. Joe Blow over here says, come stay with me. You know, when it comes, turns out that, hey, I've actually got some popularity or some people, I'm, I'm somebody of note, stay with me, and then I go up. You can see what that would do. Not only would that fuel among the disciples a love for money, and these kinds of things, it would also aggravate the people here. It would create division among the community where you are preaching the gospel. And so I'm guessing, he doesn't tell us why he says that. But I'm thinking that's why he said that. You go and you stick with the first people that take you in. And you don't try to hop. You don't try to social climb and do any of that kind of nonsense. You simply don't do that. Now, if a place will not receive them, will not extend to them common hospitality or listen to their message, Jesus tells them to disassociate from them. If they won't receive you, if they won't show you common hospitality, if they won't listen to your message, you disassociate from them, which is depicted in shaking the dust off your feet. That's what that means. You disassociate and you leave them to suffer the consequences of their rejection. You come with the word of life. You come with the gospel. It is not something that you have to sit and say, well, you know, I'm really sorry that I have this life-saving message. You come with the gospel and you present it to people. And people turn against it and blow it off and you then are to disassociate. It is not your responsibility to park there and to figure out, have I absolutely exhausted every possible way I can present this so when I'm finished I can say, I've presented it in every possible way that they might hear it. He doesn't say that. They come and present life and if somebody spits on life, he says, okay. Leave them to the consequences of their rejection. It is not your responsibility. You have presented the message of life to them. And they reject it, they reject it. And you move on, and you go on, and you disassociate from them. Now the people... Yeah, uh, hang on. So if they, don't get, if they don't get a positive response, their role is to proclaim or to announce this work of God in Jesus that is underway. They're not guarantors of a response. We are not guarantors of a response. And see, things change. Cultures change. 
You know, you may be in an environment where it's very difficult. You say something about Jesus and people say, well, look, we're post-Christian, baby. That's old news because, you know, we've, we've transcended that. Uh, you know, that was fine for my parents and my grandparents or whatever it is. But now, you know, I'm so much smarter. Okay? I've transcended those morons. You see, cultures vary. You could be in somewhere in the Middle East. Do you see? It, it's not consistent. Your function and your responsibility is to say the message. Is to tell people what God has done. He invites them into it. People will reject it. They might laugh at it. Some will receive it. But it is not your responsibility how they respond. Your responsibility is to share the news that God is doing what he has done in Jesus Christ. Now, so they preach that the people should repent. They preach that the people should repent, which Mark probably intends to be understood as a shorthand for Jesus' proclamation that Mark reported in chapter 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is probably what Mark wants us to understand. They don't, they don't just come in and say, repent. They say, repent in the context of the gospel message of what God is doing in Jesus Christ. Repent in that light. Indeed, Luke makes clear in, in chapter 9, verse 6, that at this time the disciples were preaching the gospel. They weren't just coming and saying repent. They were saying repent in the context of preaching the gospel, which as Jesus makes clear in Mark 1.15, was the good news of the arrival of the kingdom of God. You see, you've been sitting there going, people, mankind's been waiting, waiting, waiting since the fall, since all of... Oh. Unfortunate. But Lord willing, next week, thank you. <laughs>